Okay, so welcome back. So, second part of this morning, we'll speak about key establishment. So, cryptography is the science that moves protection of data to protection of keys. Just like locks um, help protecting buildings by protecting keys. And then, of course, you know how it is, you end up with a key management problem. And if you look at this building, for example, there is a couple of hundred offices, 500 people working here. And then, typically, every year, about 60 to 80 PhD students graduate and new people arrive. So, you can imagine what a key management nightmare this is. So, this is why we actually switched to batches for every door, because it became just unmanageable to deal with all the keys. But that's the same problem in real life. So the crypto is the easy part, you just install the library or you buy the product, but then how to manage the keys, that's where the real challenge is. And if you listen to the example given by rules, so it's kind of making a cryptocurrency is complicated, but what is really complicated is protecting your keys. And if you don't protect your keys, well then you can lose all your money. So we look first at how to establish these keys, so this is where the real problem is, um, and this is where the challenges are. So, of course, you have to generate keys. We'll not speak about this, but you need random number generation, and there will be a lecture on Friday about this. Then you may have to register these keys somewhere. Um, we'll speak about that in the second part. Um, this part is on establishing keys. So, you have two parties or multiple parties who want to agree on a common session key. You then have to install it in the application or maybe in the hardware you use it. And then afterwards, you have to store it or archive it. Um, or you may even want to destroy it. And then also you may have to give it an escrow uh, because what happens if you lose your keys? When you encrypt your hard disk, you work for months and months on this complicated project for your company, and then you forget your password or you lose your key and then all the work is lost. So this is actually a very complex process and this is um, if you implement cryptography where most of the problems are. So, Protocols, we first look at, given that I have secret keys, why, how can I install new secret keys? That seems a bit of a waste of time. I have secret keys, why are you going to make new secret keys? But we'll come back to that right away. Um, and then, using public keys, assume I somehow have public keys of the other parties, say of web servers or of my counterpart, how can I actually um, establish symmetric keys? And Frederick and Rule already spoke about Diffie Hellman. We'll come back to this uh, briefly, but also look at RSA to do this. And then the last question is how do I get the public key of everybody? And that's called public key infrastructure. And that sounds like the easy problem, but this is actually the hard problem in practice. So, a simple example, something you've been using every day this is the GSM protocol. Um, by the way, the same protocol is used in 3G and in 4G, as you see these slides date back to the time when GSM was still a new system. Um, so you have the base station and you have um, your mobile phone. Um, and there is a key in the base station, but in fact it's not in the base station, it's not in the indication center. Um, so at the mobile operator, and there is a key, not in the mobile phone, but in the SIM card. Because actually the operator does not trust uh, the manufacturer, um, and so there is the keys in the SIM card. And then the protocol is run, what I showed you this morning, so a random number is sent to the mobile phone, it goes to the SIM card, and then a Mac is computed um, on the SIM card using the keys called in the GSM world K KI, this is the name for a user key. So there is a database of all the user keys at the operator, and there is a KI in the SIM card. And this is how you are authenticated, so this prevents attackers from making phone calls at your expense. This authenticates you as a user to the network. But then, as I said, it would be very easy to take over the connection, to jam the GSM communication and take over. To prevent this, you actually also derive a session key uh, using the algorithm A8. You actually take the KI and you derive a session key K, and this is used to actually encrypt the communication. And so at the operator side, um, what the base station gets is the challenge, the response, and the session key. So you don't put the KI in every base station, or you don't send this to a different country. You only need the R, the MAC, and the session key K to encrypt the call. So this is more, more or less how it works. From 3G on, you actually use authenticated encryption, so you also 
MAC all the communication, which is important for SMSs and for data, but in GSM this was not foreseen. Um, the algorithms um, A8 and the MAC is called A3, they're actually in your SIM card. So they're operator specific, uh, while the encryption algorithm, which is used with this key, is called A5, and this is implemented in the phone. Okay, so this is already a reason to use session keys. Uh, first, you don't want to be using the same key all the time, your KI for encrypting all your data, because that makes life of people like Vincent and me who'd like to break stuff too easy. So you want to keep changing your key all the time, so you actually, for every call, you replace, use a new key. Also, the banks do this, every transaction has a new key. It's to make life of cryptographers or cryptanalysts miserable, because you keep changing your key all the time, okay? But there is another reason why you would do it here. This is, this KI stays in the SIM card, um, but the session key has to go to the phone. Why? Because the interface between a SIM card and a phone is cooked up by a very smart German engineer in the 80s, and it runs at about 2,000 bits per second if you're lucky, okay? So it's a very slow algorithm to talk from SIM card to phone, while your speech is much higher, or your data rate on 3G or 4G is 10 megabits, you can't push this data on the SIM card and back to be encrypted. Okay, so in fact, there is no other option than to release this key to the phone and do the encryption and decryption in the phone. And so this is why you don't want to put this highly sensitive data, this KI, in the phone, because the phone is not trusted, but you can trust the phone with the session key. That's another reason to have session keys. So in GSM, there is a lot to be said more about this, um, so that the algorithms A3 and A8 actually uh, were put in the standard as an example, but they should be proprietary, and the example in the standard was insecure. The big telecom players, they did this because competition was arriving, they had a monopoly in the late 80s, and they put on purpose a weak example in the standard, so all their competitors, their future competitors, would actually uh, put weak algorithms in their field, and then the algorithms were leaked. And then we made quite some money replacing the, helping the, the new operators to replace them by decent A3 and A8 algorithms. But not very nice practices of the large telco players, right? There is some other neat tricks um, in GSM to prevent tracking. Um, of course, you have to have a unique code called your IMSI, which you send to the network to know where you are. But if you would do this all the time, then you would be track trackable. And this would be very annoying because you know why encryption was added to mobile phones? It was because Prince Charles was intercepted talking to Camilla by some journalists before they were married, and that was actually the motivation to add encryption. Um, but of course, even with encryption, if you could still track Prince Charles, you would still know where he is. And so to stop this tracking, you get a temporary identifier, and this is encrypted using the session key, you get a temporary identifier, and next time you send this identifier, then you get a new one, and so on. So you keep getting a new identifier. Um, it's easy to break this system because in GSM, the network is not authenticated. So the network can just send a command and say, um, today we don't lo do encryption, I don't feel like it, and your phone will stop encrypting. You can say, oh, I lost your TIMC, give me your IMC again, your phone will nicely send your IMC, and so on. So 2G is very e insecure and has many flaws. And most of those have been fixed in 3G and 4G. The problem is, if you jam 3G and 4G, your phone will fall back to 2G. And you have all the security flaws of 2G. Okay, so now assume that Alice and Bob somehow have a secret key, and so they now want to generate a session key. So this is something else you could do, is you could use encryption. When people who do protocols write encryption, they mean actually authenticated encryption. So this is both confidentiality protection and data authentication, and Elena will speak more about this this afternoon. So Alice could generate a session key um, together with the time. This is always very nice to prevent replay. Of course, the problem is then how do you have uh, synchronous clocks? And then it's a message for Bob, and you encrypt this all under the secret key shared between Alice and Bob. And so Bob will get this message, he can decrypt because he has this key, he can get the session key, he can check the time, so he can check it's a fresh message, um, and he can check the key is indeed sent, indebted for him, and it was sent by Alice because Alice is the other, only other person who knows this key. Um, and then to confirm that Bob has this key, he may actually take his clock together with Alice's name and hello and encrypt this with the new session key. So this way he confirms to Alice that he actually 
um, knows the key. So this is kind of something you could have cooked up yourself at home. Right? This is how you establish from an existing key a new session key. Um, so this is what you want to achieve. Um, and so the session key, as I said, can be thrown away at the end. Um, and if Bob and Alice have multiple sessions, a client and a web server, um, they can actually have each of them having a different key. So it also allows to separate sessions. So this is very nice. And also this provides authentication because by sending a fresh timestamp together encrypted with a key only known to Alice and Bob, Bob knows that Alice must be there in the life. And by getting the answer with the session key, Alice knows that Bob must have been there because only Bob can decrypt this. And so this is how Alice and Bob also mutually authenticate each other. So this is an example of an authenticated key agreement protocol that gives mutual authentication and also key, explicit key authentication. So here's another protocol that's, I would say, even simpler, um, but it's important for historic reasons. I don't think it's widely used, but I think the concepts are interesting. So you try to use only Mac algorithms. So Alice sends a random number to Bob. So this, this time we don't use timestamps because timestamps sound good, but they assume you have a secure clock. Now just take your laptop, you can change the clock. On any device, you can change the clock. Smart cards, if you plug them out of the reader, they have no power, so they don't know what time it is, they don't know what day it is. You can tell them anything. In the, sm the smartest smart cards keep track of the latest time that they were alive. Hopefully this terminal was not lying to them. And then they know that it cannot be earlier. But they don't know actually what time it is because they have no clock. So this is why in most protocols we try to avoid clocks because dealing with secure clocks is, requires protocols by itself. And most, so the, for example, the NTP protocol is not secure. Time can be spoofed. So use a random number and then Bob will actually generate his own random number and mac this. Um, so the, you put the names, the identifiers of the parties, the random numbers, and Bob will mac all this thing. So now Alice knows that Bob is there and active because only Bob can compute this. And by writing here, B Bob confirms that he did this. And then Alice will actually um, take her name and Bob's random number and mac this again with this key. And Bob can check this. And then Bob knows actually that Alice is there and active. Okay, so now there is mutual authentication of entities. And now you can derive a session key by applying a pseudorandom function. Uh, this is just a Mac algorithm, more or less. It's an unpredictable algorithm that looks like a random function. You can use the key K prime for this, which is the second key that Alice and Bob share, and on RB in this case, and this is the session key. So it's very similar to GSM with, instead of it, and actually two steps. But so, why is this protocol important? Well, it was the first protocol for which there was actually a proof that is secure. Now, before you can prove protocol secure, you first have to define what it means to be, for protocol to be secure. That definition is already several pages. And so that took about 15 years of research before people could write down what it means for such a protocol to be secure. And then there is a proof of 12 pages to prove that this protocol is secure. That sounds like ridiculous. But you should imagine that there can be many Alice's and many Bob's running many sessions, and so you really have to find out what is what. And so the definition actually says that you can't distinguish the session key agreed from a random string afterwards. That's very important. That's how they actually define security. So this is very nice work. And so, but it shows you that proving protocol secure is very hard, right? Um, and then the other thing is, why do we use this k prime here? Well, if you would put k here, then actually the proof would stop working. And this is also you see in TLS 1.3, we have to add many new keys, not because engineers need it, but because otherwise uh, people who write the proofs can't make their proofs work. And as an engineer, it makes me always a bit skeptical that you make things more complex so your proof will be simpler. But that's the state of the art today. And so the other interesting thing is that in this protocol, Alice doesn't know that Bob has obtained the key. Alice knows that Bob has RB, but maybe Bob has crashed while doing this computation. And similarly, Alice may have crashed while doing the computation. So the parties don't know that the session key has been computed. Now you can achieve this easily by macking or encrypting something with the session key. So you use the key and by this you prove that you have the key. Well, then the proof breaks down. If you do this, 
If you actually use the key, th the proof of this protocol is no longer valid. So you can actually prove it's secure exchange, but if you use the result of the exchange, then the proof is no longer valid. So this is a bit of a painful thing. There is some papers that try to address this, but personally, as an engineer, I have a problem with the abstraction level because I think a protocol should give you also a proof the other party has it. And you should not say the other party doesn't have it, it will crash later. So we have a, there is still a problem there. Um, it's not a big problem, but it's a conceptual problem in how we prove these things. But I more want to give you how difficult it is to actually do this. And this is work from 94. Since then, there has been some progress on these models, and there is more automation dealing with this, but it's still a very hard problem. And so Roger Needham um, was professor in Cambridge and then head of Microsoft Research Cambridge. He called writing cryptographic protocols programming Satan's computer. Right? You write three line pieces of code and they can be full of bugs. And it can take you a long time to figure them out. So in many settings, you actually have, you share a key with a third party. So Alice and Bob don't share a key in advance. And the typical example is Kerberos. Kerberos was a protocol of distributed systems. Uh, project Athena, late 80s in MIT. Um, and Kerberos today is widely used because it sits in Microsoft um, authentication systems, so in Active Directory. But of course, Microsoft changed it slightly so it's not compatible with the original Kerberos. But so if you've been using Microsoft systems, like anybody who works here in the KU Leuven, you probably have been using this uh, under the hood. You've been using this protocol. So the idea is here that Alice and Bob share a secret key with a central party called the key distribution center. And so if Alice wants to talk to Bob, she says, hey, I'm Alice, give me a key for Bob. The KDC says, of course, I will make a key for you. Okay, and then I will encrypt this key under the key shared with Alice and the key shared with Bob. And so Alice takes the first field, she extracts the session key from it. Um, and she, she takes the second field, which she cannot decrypt. She doesn't know this key, KB send this to Bob, and now Bob can decrypt this, gets the key, and he can confirm he has it to Alice. Okay, so this is the principle. Before Alice and Bob share a key with a central party, afterwards they share a session key with each other. And now you can, you're in business. So some people have suggested that if large quantum computers can be built, we have problems with public key, so we should just move the world to this model. And in fact, um, in the 80s, it was not easy to assume everybody's online, but today any device is online all the time. So why not do it like this? I will tell you something, the NSA loves this model. Because if you have such a model, there is always one party, the KDC, that has all the keys. So you just have to go to this party and ask all the keys, and now you can read any communication. So in terms of security, I'm not sure it's a good example. Also, this is a toy example. Don't implement the protocol as it is. But so what you have is you have a central party, which is a single point of failure. So the Kerberos protocol is actually slightly more complex. Um, I'm not sure I want to show you all the details, but you can look at them. But there is more detailed fields to stop certain attacks. So, for example, Alice will send a nonce in her request so she can actually know that the answer from the KDC is to this specific request because you can have multiple requests. Um, and then the session key will not be just encrypted. It will actually be combined with the nonce, with the lifetime, which says how long this key can be used. This can be configured to be a morning or a day or a week. And then it also says it's a key for Bob. And so this packet can be read by Alice. And Bob gets the ticket. It's called the ticket. And so the ticket is encrypted under his key. It has also the session key. It says to Bob, you share this with Alice and it's valid for, say, the rest of the day. So Alice will decrypt this part. And this ticket she will send to Bob together with some other field. Namely, she will take the session key together with her name and a timestamp. So Kerberos assumes timestamps and send this to Bob. And then Bob will take the ticket, decrypt this part, get the session key K. Um, check it's shared with Alice, check the lifetime, and if he's happy, he will then decrypt this part, check that Alice is there again, check the timestamp, and then he will answer to Alice to confirm that he obtained the key. So this is how the protocol looks in detail, so you have more fields than just encrypting the keys, 
And this is important for security, otherwise there is many subtle attacks. So Alice and Bob now share a key. So that's more or less how Kerberos works. Again, when p protocol people, when they write encryption here, they mean authenticated encryption. So the funny thing is that when Kerberos was defined, nobody knew how to do it. And Kerberos had bad ways of doing it. Today, uh, when protocol people write encryption, we know we should put authenticated encryption, and Elena will give you an update on that. So how was this supposed to be working in the 80s, or conceived to be working? Um, what happens is that it's a single sign-on system. So you have more or less a server that Alice wants to use. So she comes in in the morning. And so she, of course, Alice doesn't remember a key. This is not what people did in the 80s. They had a password, even today. And so what she would do is she say, I want to talk to Bob today. She would get this. And in, rather than typing this key, she would type a password, which would be hashed, and then you get the key. OK, why is this called single sign-on? Because if later in the day Alice wants to work again on Bob, Alice will also store the ticket. And so an hour later, she can send the ticket again and a new message with a new timestamp. And so she can keep using the same key to authenticate to Bob for the rest of the day. So this ticket is valid for a day and can be used to obtain or use the same session key for a day. This is much better than a lazy solution where the browser just says, oh, I will store your password. Because if you then hack the password, or hack the browser, you get the password, and then you can actually log into everything. So here, if you hack Alice's device, you will only find a ticket and the session key, which is only valid for the morning or the day. So you limit the scope of an attack by having a ticket that's only usable for part of a day. You can say this is, this is called single sign-on because you only enter your password once in the morning, and then you're logged in, um, and you have a key for this server. Now, what happens if you want to use two servers? Well, then you have to, of course, ask another key and then enter your password again. So this is annoying, especially if you want to use 10 servers. So there is no problem in computer science that cannot be solved by adding a line of indirection, or level indirection, except for too many levels of indirection. So what you do is, rather than logging in and getting a key for Bob, you ask a key for the ticket granting server, so now you have a ticket for this guy, and then this guy can give you a ticket for every application you want. And so you only have to enter your password to decrypt this information. And here you actually have a key stored on your hard disk that will decrypt the information. So you now log in once, single sign-on, and you can use many applications during the day. Of course, if now this ticket and key is compromised, then you can log into all the applications of Alice for the whole day. So it's a trade-off between usability and security. Okay, so this is Kerberos. Uh, in the 90s, it could not be exported from the US. It was export controlled, even without the DES encryption software. Um, but then in 1999, the export restrictions got loosened. Um, and as I mentioned, it was integrated in Active Directory. So you probably have been using it already. So now we switch to public key. So assume I have public keys. So, a simple way to agree on a public key, and this was conceived, for example, also for, to agree on a session key is use public key encryption. Um, so, Frederick explained how it works. So, you encrypt with the public key, you decrypt with the private key, but in practice, you will not encrypt your message because RSA is too slow, or elliptic curve, or whatever your fancy public key scheme is, it's too slow for both messages. So you will actually encrypt a session key, and you will send a session key over to the other party, and the party has the private key, will decrypt and get the session key. So this is how you establish a session key with public key cryptography. Very simple and elegant. Um, and so the idea is you can use this for email. What you then do, you attach your email, encrypt it with this session key. And then the other party first gets the session key and then decrypts and can read the email. So this is the principle of secure email. Um, your browser also used this as default mechanism until TLS 1.2. So your browser generates a session key, hopefully random enough, encrypts with the public key of the server. And this is how the server gets the key by public key encryption, decrypts this, and now you have a session key shared with the browser. So 
if you go to your browser and you click on the protocol, if the protocol is TLS 1.2 or below, and you use the default public key, then actually this is what's being used. Now there are some problems with this, because you could actually intercept this message and send it again. And we call this a known key attack. So somehow assume that this key has been compromised, whatever how, because people have been sloppy, or because a key search machine has been used that has been running for two years, or whatever. You have this key, you can now send the same message again to Bob, and make Bob use the same key as two years ago. This is really undesirable, but we can stop this easily, um, as we will see. But the other question is, how does Bob know that his key is coming from Alice? So how does Amazon or Google know that this is you or your browser sending this key and not somebody else? And the answer is they don't know. This is why after TLS you have to enter your password. This is how you authenticate it. So this is kind of um, amazing that we all have this fancy public key stuff. But inside this encrypted channel, with the session key, we still actually use a password to authenticate. Right? Because this protocol does not allow um, the server to identify the user. Doesn't, Bob doesn't know who sent this. Anybody can take the public key of a server and anybody can generate a key and send it. You don't know where it's coming from. And so, of course, Alice also doesn't know that Bob has received the key. For email, this is kind of okay, because you, you never know where the email arrives, as you know. But, of course, for a web session, this is a bit annoying, because if then the key has not arrived, your browser will start producing data, which cannot be read at the other side, and so you have to start over. So you probably want to get some confirmation there. So you can do some fixes to this protocol. For example, you can add a timestamp, and that will stop the first problem, right? If you have a timestamp there, um, presumably, if you can trust the clocks of the machines, then you can at least check that it's not an old message, and you cannot replay the same thing a year later. So that is a little bit of an improvement, but not much. So now Bob knows this is a fresh message, and he knows that this was not sent a year ago. Um, if you want to add more protection, you can actually sign the whole thing. Okay, you can actually use the private key of the user to sign um, this whole packet and send this to Bob, and Bob will check with the public key of Alice. Okay. So now Bob knows that this key comes from Alice, um, and Alice knows that only Bob can decrypt, so you achieved already many more properties. So it helps. Of course, Alice still does not know whether Bob is there and active. Right, so it only helps like half. So it's just again a step forward. So it authenticates. There is still problems with this. For example, what somebody could do is remove the signature and add their own signature. Is this a problem? Well, this person doesn't know the key now, but now the server suddenly believes this key comes to somebody else. It's called the signature stripping attack. So it just one simple example to show that designing protocols is tricky, but I'll give you more, even more tricky examples. Okay? The big problem of this protocol, um, and this is now, well, the signature is Abbott because in practice you cannot recover the data from the signature, so here is the data itself and then the signature on the data, so I should have showed you the whole slide. But more or less what you were using in browsers was not this, but in fact this version of the protocol or even this version, but it doesn't matter. So this is what was the default um, in browsers until last summer. Um, and one of them, without the signatures actually, just the encryption. But it doesn't matter very much. And why do people do it like this? Well, this is very efficient. RSA encryption, we use a small exponent to the 16 plus 1. Encryption is very fast. And in decryption, you know the P and the Q. You can do Chinese remainder theorem. Decryption is reasonably fast. But you only have one public key operation, a light one in the browser, and a slightly heavier one in the server, but only one. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that the NSA can write a secret letter to, say, this is Google. They write a secret letter to Google and say, hey, Mr. CEO of Google, um, please give us the private key of Google. If you don't give this private key, the CEO goes to jail. If you speak about this letter, the CEO goes to jail. Okay? Um, only a few companies have gone to court 
like Yahoo has done it once. So we suspect that several hundred thousand of letters have been sent in the past 15 years. And only a few companies have fought them. There is, for example, one company, Lavabit, the email provider of Snowden, that shut down rather than answering the request. They just shut that company down. So the problem is, we call this forward secrecy, if at one moment the NSA comes and asks for your private key, as you know, if you send ciphertext, the NSA stores it in Utah if they can't read it right away. And so then the NSA can go to you to the database and find all messages encrypted with this key and decrypt all of them and decrypt all your communications. So if you once lose your key to a hack or security letter, you lose your whole past history. And so this is known as a property as lack of forward secrecy. And so people knew about this since 1992 when the first paper was written about this, but they kind of ignored it because it was too expensive to achieve. And then in response to the Snowden documents, within six months, Microsoft and Google switched to a solution with forward secrecy. Because it was po it's possible to solve this problem. But people kept doing the cheap thing because it was more efficient. Okay? So before we go to the solution, I'll just show you one more protocol, which is really very nice because it's a historic example um, by Needham Schroeder. So the Roger Needham who spoke about um, programming Satan's computer. So this is a very famous paper entitled On the Use of Encryption for Authentication in Computer Networks. So I don't like the term authentication there in the title. It should be entity authentication. Um, and today we know you should not really use encryption for authentication. But OK, that was 1978. So the protocol is very simple. So Alice generates part of the session key and her name and encrypts this with Bob's public key and sends this to Bob. Bob um, decrypts this. He gets K1 from it. He generates K2, encrypts K1 and K2 with Alice's public key. And then Alice decrypts this, she gets K2 from it, and she encrypts K2 with Bob's public. Okay. And then Alice and Bob hash K1 and K2 together to make a session key. Very simple, three encryptions, three passes. Um, there is still no forward secrecy in the sense that if the NSA asks for Bob's private key, they can decrypt this message here. The first one and the last one, and they have key one and key two, and it's game over again. Similarly, if they ask Alice's private key, they can decrypt the middle message, and they have key one and key two. So there is no forward secrecy in spite of the extra work. But, you know, people looked at this protocol, 1978, and they said, hmm, this really looks secure because, you know, only Bob can decrypt here. So only Bob can find K1. Only Alice can decrypt here. Only Alice can find K2. So it's clear that Alice and Bob authenticate each other, there is mutual authentication, and you agree on a key. And so this was kind of a textbook example of how to do protocols. And then in 1995, so after 17 years, somebody found an attack. And I will not spend too much time on it, but you get the slide later, you can look at them. It's a very simple attack. Um, it's not just sitting in the middle and forwarding the message, because that's not an attack. What happens here is that actually Eve sits in the middle, and she tells Alice she wants to talk to her, so Alice encrypts K1 with Eve's public key, and Eve can decrypt this, she will re-encrypt this with Bob's public key, and she will tell Bob, I want to talk to you. Okay? Bob will follow the protocol, but he believes that Alice wants to talk to him, because Eve actually put here an Alice. Okay? So Bob will follow the protocol I showed you on the previous slide, so he will encrypt K1 and K2 with the public key of Alice. Well, Eve cannot decrypt this, because she doesn't know Alice's private key, but she can forward this to Alice. And Alice will take K2 out of this, encrypt it with Bob's public key, and then Eve can decrypt this, and now she can re-encrypt this with Bob's public key. So what happens is that, at the end, Alice and Bob share a secret key, K1, K2, but Alice believes she shares his key with Eve, and Bob believes that he shares his key with Alice. Okay? And you actually run a protocol to be sure you're talking to, but here the parties are confused, and cryptography is called a jealous spouse attack. I will leave it to your imagination how you can use this um, in a certain <coughs> setting, okay? But so it shows that. Once I see the attack, everyone says, oh yes, that's how it works. It's trivial to see how it works once you get it, but still many researchers looked at this problem for 17 years. It took 17 years to find this problem. Okay? So 
It shows you how tricky it can be to do cryptographic protocols. So the first public key protocol, um, you already got explained three times. The Diffie-Hellman protocol, so it's 1975. So I'm not going to go to the details again. So you assume that there is some group you agreed on. So in practice, a prime number P or the elliptic curve you agree on. Um, and in this case, it's a prime number P, but I don't show the P and a generator alpha. So all powers of alpha generates the numbers between 1 and P minus 1. And Alice computes, uh, he chooses an X and computes after the X. I don't even show the mod P, I send this to Bob. Bob chooses a Y, computes after the Y, sends it to Alice. I think by now you got it. And so Alice computes what she got from Bob to her secret. And Bob takes what he got from Alice to his secret. And now they have a shared key. And so is this secure? Well, this is secure if the Diffie-Hellman assumption works. And the Diffie-Hellman assumption says that Diffie-Hellman is secure. So cryptographers hope that Diffie-Hellman is secure because they believe the Diffie-Hellman assumption, which says that Diffie-Hellman is secure. So we don't know. And we know if there is quantum computers, then this protocol is not secure. That do we, we do know. So if you can compute x from after the x, then it's definitely not secure. But maybe you can even find this key without ever computing a discrete log. So we don't even know that. We know that if you can compute discrete log, you can break Diffie-Hellman. But we don't know that if you break Diffie-Hellman, you can compute discrete log. For some prime numbers, it can be proven. For some others, it's still an open problem since 1975. Okay, but so. Now look at this protocol, it's a fantastic protocol, and you may know that Rivesh Shamir Edelman in 97 got the Turing Award for the RSA algorithm. Um, but Diffie and Hellman, who invented public key, and Diffie Hellman, they didn't get the Turing Award. They only got it a couple of years ago. Um, and one of the reasons why the Diffie Hellman first by itself, it sounds fantastic, right? Alice and Bob sit there, they just exchange something, and now they share a key. But again, the question is, how does Alice know she shares this key with Bob? She doesn't. In fact, you share a key with somebody, but you don't know who it is. Okay, so it's not that useful. Um, and this is being exemplified by an attack which is well known on Diffie Hellman called a person in the middle attack. The NSA sits here in the middle and Alice runs the Diffie-Hellman protocol with the NSA at this side. NSA runs one with Bob at this side. And now Alice and the NSA share a secret key, and the NSA and Bob share a secret key. Any users of SSH here? So you know what happens in SSH. In SSH, these keys are X and Y are fixed. So you choose them when you install the computer or install your device. And so when the server is being reinstalled, there is a warning say, hey, the public key of value of Bob, because so in, in um, SSH, sorry, the same key for Bob is being used and your server or your computer remembers the alpha to the Y. If the server is reinstalled, a new alpha to the Y is coming and then you get a warning say, hey, did you check that this is the right key? And what does everybody do? Yes, of course, you're not going to go take the hash, um, print it out, go downstairs to the, to the sysadmin and say, can, I, can you please check your hash value? They will just laugh at you, right? But that's what you should do because in fact, if you don't do this, um, then the NSA can be in the middle. And if you look at the Snowden documents, they are in the middle. Don't think they can't do it, right? If you look at the documents, they have the whole infrastructure. If you enter google.com in your browser, the NSA can answer before Google. The infrastructure is better, and it's called quantum insertion. They can send you an answer from them with malware included before Google can even answer you. Okay? So don't think the NSA cannot do this. This is a joke for them. They can do this easily. So please, next time, print the hash or call the sysadmin and check this. Yes? When I was still working at TOSIC, we were publishing the public keys of the SSA servers on the uh, TLS. Yes. So you can try to bootstrap uh, to, to solve these things. Now, the first time I saw the Fiamman implemented was in Swift around 1990. Um, and what they did to stop this attack, well, Swift didn't have that many nodes. At that time, I think um, about 100. They would actually um, call the other guy and read the hash value of the Diffie-Hellman key. And assume, presumably this network was small enough, they had a conference where they met every year, so they knew each other's voices, and based on the voice and they trusted the phone system, they could actually authenticate. But so then in 92, um, Diffie, Wiener, and Von Orschott published a solution. I will skip this solution. Um, 
called Station to Station. So they were working at Nortel, one of the big telco labs in Canada, which is uh, now shut down. And they came with this simple solution. It's actually the precursor of what Rule showed this morning as the Sigma protocols. Um, I show you, this is a simpler version. You trust to Diffie-Hellman. Um, and then actually Alice signs her values and Bob signs his values, the values he, he sees in the protocol. Okay, and that's more or less what you do. So what you see here is Alice sends alpha to the x and Bob signs his value so he proves it's himself. Here Alice, Bob sends a random alpha to the y and Alice signs this so she proves it's her. And so now the impersonation is stopped. You can, of course, optimize. Um, this is what the rule showed. You can send this message in the second step, and then you have three steps only. But I just show it conceptually simpler here. And then there is some technical reasons to also add some MAC values. Some, but this is the Sigma protocols. But the basic idea of authenticating Diffie-Hellman with signatures um, is goes back to 1992, the station-to-station -station protocol. OK? Now. If now the NSA knocks on your door, they will ask for your keys. So what are the long-term keys of B here? Well, the long-term keys of B is his private signing key to produce his signature. Okay, so the NSA can ask for this key. And now the NSA can sign instead of you, can impersonate, can do this meet in the middle attack from now on. But unfortunately, they cannot, or good for you, the NSA cannot use it to decrypt past communication. Because the X and the Ys, you're supposed to destroy them, not keep them at all. So you just destroy X and Y. Um, and that's how you get forward secrecy. So if the NSA gets the private key of Bob, the NSA can impersonate Bob forever. Okay? But it cannot read past communications. So this is much better. But if you now look at the cost, well, there is one exponentiation for Alice, alpha to the x, and one for Bob, alpha to the y. There is a second exponentiation to compute the key, a third exponentiation for the signature, and a fourth to verify the signature, and a fifth to verify the certificate. So in fact, if you run the whole protocol, you have five public key operations. And this is why Google and Microsoft did not want to use this um, to, instead of RSA, because it was too expensive for them. And then suddenly, when Snowden documents came, 2013, in June, by November, Google and Microsoft had switched. Because they realized that now everybody knew there was a problem and that there was a solution available called um, Station to Station, or in different variants, the Ike protocol, or it's called Ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. So here you see already the, the max included. I will skip the details. It's more for an advanced course, how you really do this to make the proofs work. But more or less, it's Diffie-Hellman with signature. That's how you can remember it. And so also TLS 1.3 um, does this uh, with the caveat that TLS 1.3 still has optional client authentication. So in fact, this signature is not sent. By default, you still only use a password inside the session. So it's actually even lighter than this. And then since then, there has been one more improvement um, called the signal protocol. So this was created by Open Whisper, and this has since then are being deployed, for example, in WhatsApp and iMessage, so used by billions of users. But my advice is use the original one, Singmo. That's the open source version of it. So this is for messaging, right? TLS is for, I mean, you have email, but you have one pass. TLS is typically you want as few round trips as possible. In messaging, you keep conversations which can last for days or weeks, and you want to protect them, OK? So, in fact, what they're using signal is something called off-the-record communication and the axolotl ratchet. That's an idea I will show on the next slide in principle. So this is to actually keep even better security. Um, so what signal achieves is confidentiality, integrity. You can read all the stuff. What I will speak about is post-compromise security. So signal looks at the scenario where the NSA asks for your private key. So if you use Diffie-Hellman, your past is protected, but they still bad for the future. So Signal tries to recover your security. It's called post-compromise security. So I compromise today. I want to get automatic security back for the future. Of course, if the NSA has put a root kit on your device or is root on your mobile phone, then nothing will happen. Or the CIA has these tools, Vault 7. I, I talked about this yesterday. Nothing going to save you. But at least 
once you update the key material, you make fresh keys. And this is what Single does. So the actual model is actually a small amphibian living in Mexico. And scientists are looking at this because, in fact, if you cut off whatever body part except for the head, it keeps going back after a while. So this is why where science will hopefully make us live forever, right? If we can discover the secret of the axolotl. But so something similar you can do in protocols. So it's a very compact notation, um, but A1 and B0 are actually Diffie-Hellman keys. So what you do is you keep sending Diffie-Hellman shares. So you have first A1 and B0. These are Diffie-Hellman shares A1 from A and B0 from B. And then, uh, then A sends, B sends a new one with this message B1. And now again, you compute a new Diffie-Hellman key. And then A sends a new share. So you keep sending new shares and you keep updating your Diffie-Hellman key. So even if you know the key now, you don't know it at next time because every time you make a new one. And so this is where the axolotl is being used. Um, it's a double ratchet because you also keep hashing your session key. So you don't do this all the time for performance reasons, Diffie-Hellman, but in between you actually hash your key. You have to be careful with this because if you hash your key too far and some messages get lost, you cannot go back, right? You cannot read all messages. So you have to be careful with these things. But it's called a double ratchet because you have a ratchet with hashing to prevent leakage of past session keys. And then you have the Diffie-Hellman refreshing. And this ID came from OTR. But so this is the next step. So beyond forward secrecy, you now also have post-compromise security. Um, so you see that we keep getting new developments in protocols. Um, and to, to end this part, I just want to show a simple protocol for entity indication. Um, so you see Alice sends a nonce to Bob. So Bob and Alice share a secret key. Bob encrypts this nonce together with his own nonce and sends it back to Alice. Alice will decrypt and she knows that this can only have come from Bob because only Bob knows his key except for herself. So Bob must be there and active. And to prove that she's there and active, she will take the NB and send this back to Bob. Simple protocol, three steps, mutual entity authentication. Well, of course not. There is an attack on this called a reflection attack. Um, a very simple attack. Um, if Eve sits there, she doesn't know this key. She just reflects the challenge back to Alice and claims to be Bob starting a session with Alice. Alice will be nice and comply and send the second message for that protocol. And Eve will say, thank you. That's what I need to complete my first protocol. And so now the protocol will complete. So now actually Alice talked to herself and proved to herself that she was there, but she thinks it was Bob who was there. Okay. So once you see this attack, it's trivial, of course. But I can tell you, if I would have shown this to you and given you weeks to think about it, you probably wouldn't have found the attack unless you had looked at the textbook. So that's actually the main message from this talk. Rule number one of protocol design, don't. Okay, we get less and less emails from people, which I used to get a lot in the 90s and 2000s. I made my own crypto system. Can you please look at this? Here is some ciphertext. Please break it for me. If you can't, it must be secure. These kind of messages, they stopped coming, but there is now many more people who think they can do their own protocols. And the answer is no, you can't. Okay, making a protocol is very tricky. There is many standardized ones like TLS, um, also Ike. The problem of them is they're very complex. You can simplify them, but only when you know what you're doing. Don't do it at home. Um, there is also some progress in security tools. For example, there is tools um, like EasyCrypt and some other formal methods tools that help you to analyze protocols. Uh, they're still not like download and install and get working. You probably still need to spend a few days before you understand what the tool actually can do and cannot do. But 20 years ago, this was science fiction. Today, actually, if you have a very important protocol, it's actually possible um, to start applying tools to at least avoid mistakes like the one I showed you before. But of course, these tools, for example, have a very hard time to deal with these kind of things. We still have to make new tools to deal with these kind of protocols. Because again, as our new features introduced means also you have to upgrade the tools. Okay, so that was the first part. I'm happy to take questions on this, but if not, we'll move on to the public key part. So now we're gonna deal with the really easy part. 
um, how to distinguish public, public keys. Okay? So how do you do this and how do you tweet and revoke them? Um, and of course, we're going to look at certificates and CAs um, and how they collaborate. So if you're a geek, you put the hash of your public key on your business card, and this is how you distribute your public uh, GPG key or SMIME key or whatever. But of course, that doesn't scale. Okay? So there is actually papers in the 80s and early 90s that proposed to produce a phone book. So people still know what a phone book is. <laughs> so beginning of January, the telco company would put a big <coughs> book. Even in, in Belgium, there were two, a yellow one and a white one. In the US, there were even three because there were competing companies having the same numbers in, in, in a different book. And so the idea was, why don't we produce a phone book of all the public keys, right? Of course, it doesn't scale very well um, because a phone number is six or eight or nine digits. A public key is 300 or 600 digits. would be a very thick book, right? It would be a very thick book and also easy to type it in and so on and so on. So we abandoned this idea. So what we use today mostly is certificates. It's a concept of 1978 invented by a master student of Ron Rivest um, for an offline world that's still being used in an online world today. So it's kind of an anachronism. Um, but we added OCSP um, as the kind of online fix to it. Um, cryptographers have also come up with many fantastic ideas. Um, and Nigel even created a company based on it. What if your name was your public key? Isn't that fantastic? Of course, governments like this because it means there is a central party that computes all the private keys for everybody. And so it sounds very good, but if you think of the consequences, it's actually a nightmare to do this, right? So you, it sounds good, but for example, if you lose your private key, you have to change your name. So if you start thinking about the consequences, it's not as good as it sounds. So I will skip that here. But so something about authentication trees, because we, you will need this, or this idea will come back in the lecture on um, Bitcoin. So more or less, Merkle had this idea, if you want to authenticate two public keys, you can hash them together. And then the three and four, you can also hash together, and you can hash those together, and you get in the end a three. And so if you authenticate the root, and you keep a path where you also, for example, if you want to authenticate Y2, you have to keep this value, this value, and this value. And then you can end the root, and you can actually authenticate any value with log number of values. You can authenticate any individual value, but you only have to centrally store and protect one root. So this is a very cool ID called a Merkle tree, ID from 1979 from Merkle. Of course, if people keep changing the public key all the time, it's annoying because you have to keep updating this tree. So it would not work very well in that kind of setting. Okay, so that's the problem. So what people use today for public keys is certificates. I guess you all know what a certificate is. So a certificate is more or less a side statement by the private key of the CA that the public key corresponds to a certain name. Um, you see a lot of all things here like CN, common name or distinguished name. Um, all this old terminology is because these standards were done by the telcos in the 80s when the telcos still were ruling the world and they were trying to introduce X400. Anybody use X400? X400 was like email, but it didn't work. That was a difference. <laughs> and then there was also X500. X500 was a database where you would find the addresses. And so X509 is actually the standard that set these things. And so it was still a telco mindset, one monopoly per country, um, and use things like, um, as you see, common name, organization, and country. This is how the world was organized. Not in domain names, but by country. It's more or less what you do is you shift the problem of keys one more time, because you can authenticate millions of public keys with a single public key named public key of the CA. Okay? Of course, the CA has to protect this private key very carefully, but you just need to protect one public key of one CA, and then you can check all public keys. So you keep moving the problem, and now the problem is just one public key. Isn't that easy? Of course, in practice, we have thousands of CAs, and now we have the question, how do we deal with the thousand keys of the CAs? And the answer is, what the fuck? No, we don't know how to do it. Deal with it. That's more or less the problem. Of course, issuing public keys is easy. Um, the real problem is revoking public keys. 
people leave the organization, people lose their private key. This is where you can actually check how something works, right? Issuing things is easy, but taking them back is the same thing with the keys in this building. It's very easy to give every position the key for the office and the key for the coffee room. The problem is when they leave, it's very hard to get hold of them and get the right keys back, right? Because, oh, I gave that key to my friend who was here and whatever. So that's the problem of this revocation. The solution of Kornfelder in 78 was that um, every day the CA would publish a signed list of revoked certificate numbers called the certificate revocation list. Um, and so this is how you would revoke public keys. Why not the names and so on for, for uh, privacy reasons? You only give the certificate numbers. In Belgium, Danny will speak about this, everybody gets an ID card, but you can choose not to activate your ID public keys and private keys. And then your card is revoked. So in Belgium, actually, the revocation list is millions of cards because one person in three does not want or in four does not want their keys to be used this way. So they all end up on the revocation list, which is a bit annoying because the CRL becomes very, very long. So, so a few things of PKI. I will be um, quite fast on background and PKI components. Uh, because this is the more standard stuff you can read in Wikipedia. I will speak about trust models, which is the more advanced stuff and the more interesting stuff where also some changes have happened. But in general, the philosophy behind PKI was, was the term was coined by Paul Van Oshot, who has lectured many times at this course. Uh, you generate your keys, you issue certificates, you use your keys, you verify certificates, you expire keys and you get new keys. So the idea is that this should be transparent for the user. There is an infrastructure like you also don't have to think about how is the Wi-Fi organized here or how do I get power exactly. You just plug in and it works. That's the same idea of public key infrastructure. So there is a key infrastructure in the building where all your keys are being managed. Okay, that's more or less what the philosophy was. Um, I would say we're still very far from that. We're, I think it's, we're making slow progress so applications can do it, but in general it's still a very big problem. If you get the job in an organization to manage keys, well, you'll be very busy. Okay, and I'm afraid that in many organizations you're still dealing with Excel sheets um, and manually updating things. That's what I still see happening in the real world. It's not something you just plug in as was conceived. So there is many pieces of a puzzle and I will not say too much about this. Um, but of course you have the CA. The CA is the entity, certificates and authority that produces certificates. It has to protect a private key that's usually in an HSM. This HSM is in a building with access control with biometrics. It's usually under the ground and there is a guard with guns around it and some dogs. So it's like a couple of million euros to run such a thing, right? That's what the CA does. And what it does is it gets public keys and it signs this. Yes? There are no dogs or guns. <laughs> it, it is underground. <laughs> it depends. I've seen some with dogs and guards. But I think conceptually it's important to understand that you need physical security. That's the image I want to keep to people. That you need physical security. So, and of course you need to also find, uh, agree on what's in such a certificate. Um, because what I didn't show to you here, I showed you a certificate. So which has validity period and public keys and so on. What it really is, is a contract. So with the certificate comes a statement of 80 pages done by the lawyers which more or less says, whatever happens, we'll never give you anything, okay? So we, I never heard of a story of a CA paying money to anybody because they made a mistake. Because of 80-page legalese, it more or less says, pay us for a certificate. If something goes wrong, too bad for you. Clause 77, 4.4.3.2.1 says this is not our problem, right? CAs just collect money. It's like insurance companies, but they hardly ever pay money. Insurance companies sometimes pay, but CAs, my experience is they never paid so far. Okay, so that's important to, to see that. The question is, should they generate your keys? This question um, was very hot in the 90s because some governments tried to regulate CAs and say CAs have to regulate, generate keys for users and they have to give a copy to the government. And then the EU came in and said, you cannot regulate CAs, which was a very good intention, but was a very stupid thing because it also meant that security of CAs was not regulated. And it gave rise to the Ginota example where more or less Diginota had a very secure HSM with guards and maybe no dogs, maybe it was cats, but whatever, they had something to guard. But they were connecting the HSM to an insecure PC, which was on the internet without firewall, without antivirus, without updates. And so Iranian hackers broke into this PC and then had the CA sign certificates, right? So 
And part of it is because you're upset you can't regulate CAs. <coughs> With good intention, because some governments wanted to get the keys. Of course, you can ask users to do it, and this is today easier because smart cards can do it today, although there have been some glitches, and you can look at the literature, for example, in uh, Infineon cards a couple of years ago, Taiwanese cards, and Infineon cards were certified, but they generated uh, bad keys. Uh, or you can outsource it. So in Belgium, actually, the, there is a compromise. The key is generated in the card, but while the card is still in the processing of the, the, the company processing the cards in Zetas' hands. But Zetas cannot read out the private keys, as far as we've checked. Need a database for certificates. Um, it used to be X509, but X509, FX500 database was too complex, so people invented LDAP. LDAP stands for Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. The important word is lightweight, because the X500 was so hard to use that people switched to something easier. Okay? Then you have revocation. Uh, we'll come back to that. We discussed CRLs, but there is other options like OCSP, and this is where things usually go wrong. So in the 90s, um, what I did is, so there were some banks that were using public key, and they had a CA, and they wanted an audit, so they called PricewaterhouseCoopers or Deloitte. But these people, they had uh, very flashy cars and very nice suits, but they didn't know anything about PKI, so they called me in. And so I did just the technical audit together with some of my collaborators. Um, and I always ask the question, what will happen if your root key is compromised? And they looked at each other, they looked at the ceiling, looked at the floor, and after five minutes said, this will never happen. That was the only answer I ever got. Because if that happens, if a CA loses their key, well, look at DigiNotar, they lost control of their key and they went out of business within a month. Okay, so as a CA, you just hope it doesn't happen. You make sure that if you work there, you have another job off already because if this key is ever compromised, hell breaks loose and there is no solution. In the case of DigiNotar, all the main browsers had to give an update to fix the problem, right? To give you an idea of the impact. So there was a billion of devices to be updated because some people could not install a firewall and run antivirus. Okay, then there is automated key update and history. So I think it should be transparent to users what's actually happening, so I will not say too much about that. Um, key backup and recovery is also a very good one. As I mentioned, if you encrypt all the work you do for your company uh, with a key and then you lose this key because USB stick fails or whatever, or your memory fails, or both fail, or one of them fails, you lose everything. So if you really have all your data encrypted, you want somewhere a backup. Okay. So then the question is, who can access this backup? Because if the sysadmins just have a file in their drawer, which I also have seen uh, in some banks, which I will not name. So I asked them, where's the private key? And then a guy of 22 years old opened his drawer and said, here on a floppy disk. OK, I'm not kidding. OK, that was the private key was in the guy's uh, drawer. Um, but so yeah, how do you control this access to these backups? You need at least two people. But I guess not only sysadmins, because you, know, you really want to have somebody more important involved. So there's quite some problems. Uh, there's also been push from the government who said, we also, well, we want to have keys anyway for law enforcement purposes. We'll keep all your keys. And if you want them back, you can ask us. Of course, the problem is that the law enforcement access they mostly need is for communications. Right? And that, for companies, you don't need the backup of this. If your communication um, is actually uh, if you lose the key, well, so what? Then you just start up a new session. So there is no point in keeping keys for communication, which is what the police wants. What you want as a company is keys for storage. You want the backup of those. But you also want the right processes to control access to this. Okay? So I think this is more or less summarized on this slide. Don't be very careful who gets access to this, because if this is somewhere in a drawer of one guy who is underpaid and has a grudge, well, you're not going to end up well. Okay, so and I guess I mentioned already the key score problem, the warning. And then we believed in the 90s it was very important to get non repudiation of origin so that you could actually prove you signed something. Although it's kind of amazing today, we order a lot of stuff on the internet, even expensive things. We use TLS for a session, but we don't authenticate the user, we authenticate with a password, and somehow it's enough. We actually never sign anything. Um, even if you file your Belgian taxes, 
you actually use your identity card, but you don't sign your tax form, you sign the Diffie-Hellman value you get from the tax office, which is kind of, you never even sign your tax form, which is kind of amazing. I think at, at least in the beginning, and maybe they have fixed it by now, but we kept complaining about this. Um, Cost certification I will come back to later. What if there is multiple CAs? Uh, an interesting one is timestamping. So, uh, of course, you have to put things in time. And there is a company called Surety Technologies, created in 94, that actually does timestamping of your documents. Because in the past, engineers had a lab book in which they would write their experiments. And they had this lab book stamped or signed by the manager, say, every week or every month. But today, of course, everybody uses Microsoft Word or OpenOffice or LaTeX or whatever you use. But you all know you can change the date on any document in your computer. So what this company offers is a service where you send a hash of your files and then they include it into a Merkle tree and they produce like a blockchain. This is the first blockchain company, Avana Letter, was created in 94, called Surety Technologies. They still lose money. They still haven't added blockchain to their name. I don't know why, because they would suddenly be worth several billion dollars. But so you actually want to put documents in time, but also you want to do it for signatures. And you need to do this for business requirements or patent lawsuits. But of course, sometimes your private key may be compromised because you lose your smart card or a rootkit gets installed or whatever. So, of course, if you first sign something and then your private key is stolen, well, the signature is valid, obviously. Okay? In the other case, if your private key is stolen and tomorrow a signature shows up, well, this is clearly done by the hacker, so this is not valid. So you actually have to know when a signature was placed. Solution, you put the date in the signature. Happy? Of course not. The bad guy will put the date of two days before in the signature. Once he has your key, he can put any date. So this shows you need an external party that actually puts your documents or signatures in time. Right? So amazingly, we use PKI, but very few organizations actually have time stamping services, which you actually need if you really want to prove when a signature was made. And this is essentially if you want to verify a signature properly. So the, the main message is signatures are fantastic, but we don't use them for code updates, but not for really signing stuff. Because if we would, we would have to use all these things. There is still a technology to be developing amazingly. So I still sign things on paper every day. Or I click in SAP. Which, of course, is that secure? I don't know. But, but at least we have not, still not incorporated digital signatures in our business process. There's now more and more companies doing it. Uh, and, of course, they all have proprietary interfaces and problems with certificates and whatever. So it's, it's lousy today. Okay? Good. So then, of course, you have to change all your software. But so the vision of the PKI companies was that there would be one PKI to rule them all for your email, for your web for your secure desktop, for a single sign-on, for e-commerce, and for VPN. And of course, we know this is a dream from the 90s, which never happened, because we still don't decrypt our email. Um, on our desktop, we have our own PKI in every Microsoft Windows computer since 2000. There is a full PKI in there, which nobody uses. Um, single sign-on is still based mostly on symmetric key. Um, e-commerce is based on TLS and credit card numbers being sent in a secure pipe. VPNs, people do manual key management manually because the rest is too complex. So this dream never happened except for the web, but we will see what the problems are of the dream. So there, of course, we have a big PKI. So the main message is that doing a PKI is complex because you have to think of many things. So it's not saying I start up a PKI and I do this. Okay, it's interesting that in the 90s, we had the same PKI hype as we have today in the blockchain hype. So in the 90s, every bank had seven PKI projects. Um, and of course, what happens then, the same thing will happen in blockchain, I predict you. Then people said in 2000, PKI is dead. And so in one or two years, there will be a big announcement in the press, PKI, uh, blockchain is dead. Right? So the same thing, if you believe too much in it. And again, it's complex, you have to integrate with everything. On the other hand, you do need it. It's a useful building block. Because if you don't use PKI, how are you going to distribute your keys then? So you need it, but it doesn't mean you need seven projects, and it doesn't mean it's easy. Okay? It's an essential technology, but it's kind of complex to integrate. And I think blockchain has very similar features as well. It's being overhyped, and we're going to see a big crash as well. So the standards 
from CCITT uh, were taken over or copied and profiled by IETF, which is nice because you can have access to them. Um, because CCITT, I think somewhere in COSIC we still have a copy of this famous standard, but you had to order like meters of paper to get these five, five uh, pages of, of uh, 10 pages of X509. So the world has changed. If you look at these standards, um, and I'm afraid I had to do it because I was involved as an expert in some lawsuits, and then you start reading these standards, then you realize that the CA area was a gold mine area. So everybody wanted to be a CA because your cost was, depending on whether you would have dogs or not, was one to two to three million dollars. It was the cost to operate a CA. Okay, that's more or less the cost range. The income they predicted to investors was the following. There will be two billion people on the internet. I will charge them hundred dollars for a certificate per year. So the total addressable market is 200 billion dollars and my company will get 10% market share. So my income will soon be 20 billion dollars and my costs are two million dollars. I see people smile, but many, many people bought shares in these companies and Mr. Shuttleworth went on the space shuttle with all this money because people actually believed it and the shares had astronomical values. Of course, we know today that nobody ever bought certificates because why should you as a user buy certificates? It only helps other companies, it doesn't help you. And the servers, they bought certificates, so about 10 million of them, maybe five or six paid money and they paid a few thousand, 5,000, 10,000. So the total addressable market was still a few billion, five to 10 billion, because they're not valid for one year, they're valid for five or 10 years. So it was a billion dollar market. So some people still made a lot of money. But as a consequence, we of course ended up with thousands of CA companies all having the same business model. Does it sound like cryptocurrencies? <laughs> well, it's a different technology, but it's the same game. It's got most kind of an interesting gold rush. And so the problem is then you have to end up with multiple CAs and it depends on the context what you do with them. So we say that A trusts B when A assumes that B will behave exactly as A expects. And if B doesn't, then A has big trouble. So you should actually avoid trust. It's very interesting if you look at government agencies, they always want to emphasize trust and they finance research on trust and whatever. We should actually avoid trust, right? Because trust means that you're weak. What we want to design is trustworthy systems, actually that you can pay confidence in what they do. So, and a trust model is a representation of who you trust in a system, so the relation between the parties in a secure system. So, a simple picture is a CA model created by the telcos. So you have the root CA would be in Geneva, um, and you have all the users, all the people with a telephone or an internet connection, that was their model of the world. They would all trust CCITT, the logo, just like today you trust the Visa logo. And then they would issue certificates for every user. And this is how you would authenticate all public keys. And I guess they realized that this was an easy model because now you only have to pay once for all the guys with the guards and the concrete and the basement. But of course, then it was a bit difficult for everybody to deal with this agency in Switzerland. So the idea was to have national system or the national telcos would be subordinate CAs um, and the Geneva guys would issue a certificate for subordinate CAs, say Belgacom or Deutsche Telekom, and they would issue certificates for the users. So you have certificate on the public key of the Deutsche Telekom and they would issue a certificate on the public key of the users. But the users would still trust the CCIT logo, just like today you still trust the Visa logo. So I guess you all know that you don't have a Deutsche Telekom certificate or Proxima certificate or whatever certificate, but you do have all Visa certificates. So in fact, this model happened in the financial sector with Visa, MasterCard, and so on. They managed to create this model where the subordinate CAs are the banks and Visa makes the rules for the whole system and everybody trusts the Visa logo, the cardholder and the merchant. We all trust Visa and Visa makes the rules. And this is how it works. So what you then get is certificate chain Okay, so the trust is in the public key of Visa. That's what happened in the real world. And this public key is written in every terminal. There is about 40 million terminals globally, and they're all the public key of Visa. Of course, also the previous public key, also the next public key, also the public key of MasterCard. So in the end, there will be a couple of dozen public keys in there, but that's the trust base on which you base everything. Um, and then they will sign the public key of the banks. And then the lease certificate is the public key 
of your card is signed by the private key of the bank and gives a certificate in the card. That's called a certificate chain that ends up in the root, and the root is self-signed. So you sign yourself, it's like pulling yourself up with your own hair. It means nothing, right? But you just say, well, nobody else will sign it, I will sign it myself. But it means nothing because you can take any key and just sign it with itself. It just means that there this chain stops. It makes no sense to, start to check this signature, right? It's kind of, well, you can check, but no bit is corrupted because then the signature will fail. So of course, in the real world, as I told you, every bank had their own PKI, every company had their own PKI. So for example, Siemens and Nokia have their own PKIs. And the users of Siemens trust, of course, Siemens, and the users of Nokia trust Nokia. But then they want to start doing business. So this is the local rules, but certificates being signed locally, and the trust relationship is also locally. And then they want to do business, say there is a merger. So now you can have a simple solution. So Siemens will sign the public key of Nokia. Nokia will sign the public key of Siemens. It's called cross-certification. And now there is a path from user A in Siemens to user B in Nokia because A trusts the public key of Siemens. Siemens signs the public key of Nokia. Nokia signs the public key of Bob. So there is a certificate chain from here to here. And there is a trust relationship to the beginning of the chain. Yes? Does it mean CB needs to serve a different certificate for itself? Serve a self-signed certificate to B. Yes. But to A, it must self-serve the, the CA sign. Exactly. Yes. That's what it does. Yes. Yes. Because B trusts CB, but A does not. And so A uses. A has a different. Word. We'll come back to the web servers. It's different. Of course, you can now add more players, and you can see computer scientists already glowing eyes because you can now make an arbitrary graph, and you can ask questions like, does there exist a path from A to B? How many paths exist? How long are the paths? Whatever. Of course, what you should remember is that every one of those arrows comes with a contract of 80 pages. So if you put three of those contracts together, then you have a very complex contract. You then ask five lawyers what it means, and they give you seven opinions. <laughs> That's the problem why this actually does not work, because not of technical reasons. There is graphs, but what with the contract? That's the problem. What does it mean? Who will pay if something goes wrong? To solve this, the hub and spoke method was invented um, in America for automobile exchange, the ANX. So there you had, at that time, the big three. Tesla was not there yet. Um, and so they created a hub and spoke model. So they created an instance in the middle. And if you wanted to supply to any of the big three, you had to be part of this network. So you had to create your own CA. You had to cross-certify with this CA. And then the, all the paths were short because they went at most from the user to a CA to the center to a CA to the user. So they had paths of certificate paths of length three and a trust path of length four. Okay? So this central party is not the same as in the hierarchical model because it doesn't make the rules because four General Motors and Chrysler make the rules. Okay, they just implement the rules. They're a trusted agency in between. The big players make the rules, but everybody coordinates with this and you get a very efficient solution. So this is a pragmatic way how to make things interoperate and of course you make one contract for this party and for everybody else. So in rather than having three contracts you only have one contract which governs these cross certifications. So now what happened in the browsers? So we have to wind back to 93, 94. So the browsers came so people could start using the internet and then people suddenly realized you could do commerce on the internet by sending over credit card numbers. And people thought, maybe people will steal them, so we're going to have to encrypt them. So this is why Netscape, the first browser company, um, actually ordered some people to make a standard called SSL to encrypt stuff. Um, and so the idea was that, as I told you, every user would get a certificate and every server would get a certificate. Um, and these public keys of the CAs would be written in the browsers. That's the model. Of course, we know what happened. Users never bought certificates, except if you were Belgian or Estonian, because then the government gives you a card with certificate, which you can import in your browser. But we're kind of the weird people in the world. And I talked to Google about this, and their answer was, why should we trust the Belgian government? <laughs> it's kind of for Belgians, it's kind of, how can we believe this? How all country is based on this trust infrastructure, but Google says, why should we trust this? Right? It's kind of amazing that they trust their own spying better than the structures of the Belgian bureaucracy, which is... 
interesting. But anyway, so the users don't get certificates, but the companies did get them because if you didn't have a certificate, there was a pop-up saying, this website may be dangerous, continue, yes, but you lost a few customers and whatever. So actually the, the servers got certificates, but of course I explained you the business model. The business model was $3 million cost and $20 billion addressable market. Okay, with the servers, it's only $2 billion, but okay. So there were lots of companies. Um, so more than 1,000 companies were created, all wanted to be a CA. So the browser companies wrote all the CA public keys in the browser. That's what they did. So if you actually use your browser, uh, so this is the servers here being getting certificates from any of the CAs, and the user have to trust all of them because they're all in your browser and you have to trust them. So in fact, if you use your browser, you trust all of them. In most cases, you don't even know which one was used. Okay. So who is in there? Well, I invite you to go to your browser during the coffee break or tonight, and you will find 660 companies in there, and each of them with multiple keys. And I must say there is very interesting companies in there. Okay. For example, Komodo was breached. Um, but so you trust all of them. The French government is in there, the Chinese government, the Turkish government, um, any government you like to trust. The CIA probably owns several of these companies as well, and NSA probably also. So by using your browser, all these players can actually um, subvert you. So the other thing was that actually, if to get a CA as a server, I mean, in, in Belgium as a company, there is a register. There is a crossroad bank, so as a company you have to register, get a number and whatever, you have to keep it up to date. In the US there is no such rigid infrastructure. So if you claim to be ABC, you just buy the website and you start. Of course you still have to incorporate your company, but there is much less bureaucratic checking. Okay. So what did the CA company do? It got an email from somebody saying, here's my company name, here's my public key, please sign. Here's a check of $3,000 and they would actually get an answer. How do we know that there was no checks? In 2001, some employees of Microsoft, alleged employees of Microsoft, got code signing certificates from VeriSign, one of the, the big players um, in the CA market, um, and they just got them signed. They were not from Microsoft. And then the interesting thing started. It turned out that IE didn't do revocation checking. So of course, VeriSign revoked the keys, but nobody bothered checking, so Microsoft had to rush to implement CRL checking because it would slow things down, right? And then, otherwise, the revocation would have had no effect, and you could spoof Microsoft code. So, and then in 2007, I still remember because I had to leave the press conference because I couldn't stop laughing. So all these CA companies were giving a talk saying, we're now going to really check. So we have to admit something. We've been sending you certificates, but we never ever checked whether there was a real company behind it. But now we're going to really check, and we're going to charge you extra money for that, and we're going to do something magical. We're going to make something green appear in the browser to show we really checked. Please pay now the double price. Okay, it's called extended validation because nobody else can make some field in the browser green. This is completely exclusive to some companies who can do this. Um, so of course, even then there were problems like people could register. So of course you can block things like bank, bank of the vest with two W's, two V's, sorry. Um, but more or less this thing uh, has recently died. So in fact, after 11 years, the scheme has died because like uh, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Opera start uh, giving, uh, withdrawing support for this. So this was another attempt to um, make more money without me doing less work, okay? Um, in 2010, EFF actually did a study of what's happening in the browsers, and the paper is called the CA mess on the web, or describes CA mess on the web. So at that time, there were 11 million servers starting the handshake, about half had the valid, valid certificate chain, um, there were 650 CAs. The CA browser forum claims there is only 80 companies left, but some companies are long bankrupt, but they're still in there. Who owns their keys? Like Baltimore, who owns the keys of Baltimore? But they're still in your browser. But who has bought these keys? This company is bankrupt for more than 10 years. Very interesting stuff. Um, so there was 1.4 unique valid lead certificates of which the largest market share is GoDaddy because they're the cheapest and they checked the list. Um, there were keys in multiple certs. Um, people signed the IP address 192.168.1.2. Really? Really? <laughs> um, people still had 500 bit keys, which in 2010 probably took a day to factor and today a few minutes. The CS just signed this. 
Um, I skipped this story, but more or less there were compromised keys issued by Debian. The CS didn't do anything to, they should actually detect those keys and revoke the certificates. They just did nothing. They just had, they got their money, so what should they do? Okay. So then there were many efforts to fix this. I will, I'll try to give you a summary of what happened. Uh, but there were more incidents, Commodore incident. Um, then the Hinota incident I mentioned already. So what happened there is the PC interfacing the HSM was hacked. Um, and then some users in Iran got fake certificates for Google and Facebook. And this was used by the government to intercept their communications and probably they may still be in jail because of this. How did we find out? Because their browsers did a request for CRL or for OCSP to the CA. So these requests arrived and so then they could see that, hey, did you know there is a Google certificate or Facebook certificate? Interesting. We didn't know about that. This is how the attack was detected. Okay, so they went bankrupt. And then the Turkish were caught. Um, Bit9 lost the signing key, which something would never happen, I told you. Um, CC India was caught, China was caught, the French were caught, Symantec was caught, all issuing fake certificates to spoof communications. And in most cases, it was a mistake. Oh, sorry, we made a mistake. Okay, so it's even worse, like Lenovo issued a PC in which there was another certificate added to the, P the root store, and the private key of that certificate was also on the PC when you bought it. So this is like, you know, how can we undermine everything by making it terrible? Well, this, this has been done. Um, you may hear more about it tomorrow. Um, so, in fact, Etsy in Europe has seen this Diffie-Hellman protocol and they hate it because they can't intercept it anymore. Because all the middle boxes in banks have to intercept communication to check for compliance. So they made a variant of TLS called Enterprise TLS where the server keeps using the same value of Y all the time, and this can be stored in the middle boxes, so all the middle boxes can read all TLS communications. Okay, so this is what's happening with our good protocols. So there was a study done a couple of years ago for the mobile CAs, and it's the same misery. Uh, if you have old Android, it doesn't even su support SHA-2. Um, there is still MD5 certificates in there. Uh, most apps allow all host names. Um, you can use an common trust store for the whole app store, or you can use an app specific trust store, but they're both equally bad. Um, so this is blue box of this study, and I'm not sure this has improved. So more or less, we had the chance to do it better in the mobile ecosystem, but we messed it up equally badly in the mobile ecosystem. Okay, that's the main message. And then something changed. Um, also, I think driven by Snowden, some academics together with some companies uh, like VMware got together and actually said, let's issue free certificates because in fact only a small percentage of the web is encrypted and most certificates you pay for nothing is checked anyway, why not give them for free and make it easier by giving you easy scripts to install certificates to make it easier to use. Um, and then they took some decision not to have revocation, but have short-lived certificates. Okay, so this solved a lot of infrastructure problems. Um, and so what happened is that Firefox traffic in 2016 and 2019, encryption went up from 40% to close to 70%. The number of servers with certificates went from 10 million to 50 million. So they're really a very big success. It's called Let's Encrypt. And so they really are a big success. Um, but of course, there are some problems, which is they don't check. So there is 70 or probably by now 100 certificates which have some variant of PayPal in their name, but an L replaced by a 1, or two A's, or two Y's, and Let's Encrypt will happily give you certificates. Because they say, that's not our problem. We don't guard the domain space. If users are fooled by the certificate, that's not our problem. We guarantee that this domain and this public key belong together. We don't say anything. We don't make any statements of PayPal with an L replaced by a 1. That's not our problem. Or, of course, if you report a website as being fraudulent and you say, please revoke it, they say, no, we wait until the certificate expires. So some people are very upset with Let's Encrypt. Um, but I think if you look at it in balance, they've done more good than bad. But of course, users should accept that they should also check the domain name and not only be happy when the certificate is there. So after DigiNota and the other incidents, there were quite some efforts to do something about this. Okay. Um, one is Dane. It's more or less the idea is we have DNSSEC, which took 10 years and then actually never got rolled out except for Netherlands and Sweden. If we have secure domain names, we can also add public keys to it. 
The problem is nobody uses the NSX or nobody uses DEN either. So this is something governments could enforce more, but nothing is happening. We have authorization. This is the response to the fact that did you know that it could issue Facebook certificates? But Facebook does not have DigiNotar as its CA. So Facebook should be able to say which CAs it authorizes to issue certificates for itself. So that was the idea, to prevent this kind of attacks. Um, but in fact, it's only used on 4% of the sites. And it has some competition issue because once you, of course, make a statement, it becomes harder to go to a new CA because you just said you wouldn't do it. Um, and there is pinning, what I discussed this morning. Pinning, it works very well if you have the Google scenario or the Apple scenario where the browser and the website or the server are from the same company. Then the browser will store the public key of this website, and so if it changes, it will detect it. This is, by the way, how Google has been spotting all these government attacks by seeing strange certificates for all these websites and then finding out who issued them. Okay? It works very well for Google and Apple. It doesn't work well for your startup company or for your mom and dad store around the corner because they will never end up in the Chrome browser with their certificates. And then the nicest effort is called Certificate Transparency. Google is behind this, but also some other larger players are now investing in this. Um, and there the idea is that every CA should register which certificates they've issued in a Merkle hash tree. And as a user, you can actually find out evidence where the certificate was registered. And so this should stop governments from actually doing this, because if they would issue a fake certificate, they would have to report this, and they would more or less have to incriminate themselves. So you can see that some governments don't like this solution. Okay, so it's not widely deployed. The overhead is quite big, so only large players can run it. And there is privacy issues, because as a user, if you check where a certificate is in this tree, you actually reveal you're going to this website. Okay, so it's only more for orbit after the fact than stopping attacks. But it's still something we I think should encourage more because it's going to help things. Um, there is also some efforts happening. I think Mozilla is also looking at some recent academic papers to improve the PKI finally. So it may finally start happening 10 years after all the big incidents. So of course there is usability problems as well. I was giving this talk at a company, Western Digital, and then if you look, click on the certificate, it says issue to SanDisk. Of course, if you know that SanDisk bought this company, that's okay. But if you don't know, what will you do with this information? Right? You first have to start searching. Um, also, the information in there is not so visible. They still speak of um, RSA encryption when they mean signature and so on. So you can click on those things, but it's not so usable. Right? Uh, that's a, a very big problem. So I think I will wrap up here. One more minute. So there is also the web of trust from PGP where you sign the keys of your friends. That's very nice until you have to do revocation. Because I have, in my life, I had three PGP keys, but who has those keys? And how can I revoke them? That's a major problem. There is now key servers, but again, if you want to register a key for Bill Gates there tomorrow, nobody will stop you. That's a bit the same problem as, um, let's say, encrypt, right? If you're not centrally governed, um, you have some issues as well. So to wrap up, so Danny will say a few more things about um, OCSP, when he discusses the EID card, I will ask him about this. So, strange enough, the PKI we actually use today is the project of a master thesis of 1978 for an offline world. And so, it's not surprised that this actually is a problem to be used in an online world today, so it's not at all optimal for the online world today, but we try to make it work. But as you see, changes are very hard. If you go to talks by the browser companies or CA companies, they say fixing these things is like changing the wheels of a bicycle while driving it. So they claim it's very hard to fix things. There is also vested commercial interests against changing things. So it requires either regulation, and of course for governments it's very hard to understand all these issues, or large players working together to make something happen. Okay, but I think we still need to work on it because PKI is not that. We need it to get public keys, we need public keys to get symmetric keys to get secure communications and secure storage. Um, the big problem in practice is always revocation. How will you revoke stuff? And if somebody can tell me what they will do when their root key is compromised, I'm always willing to listen because that's what something you should prepare for. And the answer is I will go bankrupt. It's probably not what your investors want to hear or your shareholders want to hear, right? So I will 
leave it here. So I hope you have a nice lunch and um, a good continuation of the course. Thank you very much.